and teach you. Amen. We're going to have fun and we're going to do this. I'm going to call this subtitle. We've been teaching on reigning in life in Christ, but the subtitle of this is Common Sense for a Believer. Common Sense for a Believer. How many here believe that God wants us to use common sense? I, I went to the bank years ago, and you know, and I, I was taught how to count change. You know, when somebody gives you 100 and, and they spent like 88 and how to give the change back. You know, I went to the bank years ago and the teller couldn't count back the change. He had to use the machine. Kind of made me wonder. So I believe what the enemy's been doing, if you look at society briefly, he's been dumbing down everything. Now, I'm not picking, I'm not going to run around and pick on things. That's not the message I want to bring you. But everything seems broken and dumbed down. You ever know that? I'm going to tell you because those are the people that are listening to the serpent, the fallen one, his dictations. Remember, the devil caused Adam and Eve to fall? And you and I are a product of Adam and Eve's fall? And our DNA was changed? Hello, we didn't just disobey God, but our flesh and DNA was changed so that your flesh and your blood cannot go to heaven. It has to be changed. Read 1 Corinthians 15. Read about changing. Why God has to change this mortal body and change it into an immortal body in Christ. Hello, aren't you glad? All right, so I want you to just go with me. We're going to read our, our, our scripture right up there. I have it before me, but hopefully it's up. Amen. So Proverbs chapter 1. I want you, we're going to cover common sense for the believer. Amen. So Proverbs chapter 1, look at verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon. Proverbs mean the standard of balance. Everyone say standard of balance. Of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom. The word know means to know by experience wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction to be taught, see, receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. Everyone say equity. That means balance, balance, having balance in your life. Four, to give prudence to the simple, very interesting phrase, and to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man, listen, will hear and increase learning. That's why you're here today. To hear and increase learning. Okay? And a man of understanding who tries to understand it will attain to wise what? Counsel. Now, aren't you glad that almost 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost, the Father sent the Spirit of God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and filled the entire earth. We learned that. Read Acts chapter 2. And it was suddenly, the, another system came into operation. The kingdom of heaven now came with that spirit. The Holy Spirit brought the kingdom of heaven. Say kingdom of heaven. And now it's in full operation in the earth. But here's the key. The only way you and I have access to this kingdom is through Christ. I said not in Christ. Listen to my words carefully. It's through Christ. Read your scripture. It's through Christ. We go through Christ to the Father. We go through Christ to others. We reach out in love and go through and reach out in love. Can you say amen? It's a compassion. Be moved by compassion. Hello. It is beautiful. Okay, we need to have that understanding. Now, go with me to Proverbs chapter 8. Look at verse 4 through 6. Here's, let's pretend that this is being spoken directly to us. Remember the words just like that, because the word is God. God is the word. They're interchangeable. Okay. To you, O man, oh, thank you, I call. Now, let me ask you, the last five years, God has been calling intensely to his children to come pray again. Instead of just doing things and doing all this, come back to the roots of prayer and meeting with God. Wow. And people are obeying. 
And that brings revival. Can you say amen? To you, O man, I call. And my voice is to the sons of men. O oh, you simple ones. That's all of us, by the way. I'll explain that again today. Understand prudence. Everyone say common sense. Prudence is common sense. Listen. You get in your car and you head out on the road. Common sense says, look at your gas gauge. Let me give you one. This is fun. I don't know why, but I have always in my life been able to look at things and see how to either have them done better or do them better, even though I can't myself do all of that. For example, how would you, what would you do if somebody, uh, you know, did something, but they did it backwards? You would say, that's just not common sense. In other words, common sense means, look, don't drive more than you have gas. Don't eat more than you need. You know, it sort of talks about balance. So we won't emphasize that point, but it's very important. So, oh, you simple ones, understand prudence. Oh, you fools. Now, please don't be insulted by that, because that's somebody who refuses to learn. Now, we have different phrases or understanding by the word fool. And Jesus said, don't call any man a fool. But we need to understand that Hebrew here means a fool is someone who refuses to learn. Not somebody who can't learn because there are people that are challenged but who refuse to learn God calls them a fool. Now, I didn't insult anybody, right? Right? Because the scripture says only a fool will say there is no God. Because, here's the funny thing. Every human being knows there's a God. Read Romans 1. They know there's a God, but they deny God exists. Because the serpent's whispering in the ear, just like Adam and Eve. And they're biting at the fruit. And if they're not careful, he'll change them into something different than human. Oh, Pastor Kerry, no, I tell you what, have you ever seen some of the weirdness that's going out there? Don't look. The Bible says it's even a shame for us to talk about them. Now, I'm not picking on people. I'm talking about how the devil tries to corrupt God's beautiful creation. You're beautiful. You are God's people. Amen. And you all know there's a God, and you now have made peace with his son. The Father has accepted you in him and wants to embrace you. But we have to surrender to want to come. Keep coming, keep coming, keep changing, keep changing, because only God's the one that changes us. How many found out this? You can't change yourself. Amen. Come on. Amen. You tried to quit this, couldn't quit it. You quit for a while, but you went back to it. But come on. Because the devil won't let you quit anything. That's why we need Jesus running our life, running the show. And I'm so amazed at some of the wonderful Christians that still living for God with all their might, and yet they're tired and worn out. They miss the point. The point is you don't live for God only. You let God live through you and sustain you. You should be getting stronger like youth, like an eagle, instead of wearing out and becoming stupefied. Smile up at me. Are you ready? So, oh, you, oh, man, I'm calling to you. Listen, for I will speak. This is verse 6. Speak excellent things, and from the opening of my lips will come right things. There's two systems operating in the world, BJ. One's a system of darkness that hides things from our eyes. One's a system of light that reveals them before our eyes. Now, who would want to hide things, and who would want to reveal things? Depending on who you lean to, because set before you every day is life and death, light and darkness. Therefore, we are to choose as we meet with God first thing, Lord, enlighten me, flood me. Lord, cleanse me, wash me, fill me, Lord, so I might have your wisdom and your knowledge. And then we enter our day like that. Say amen. All right, let's get into our scripture in our lesson. Common sense for a believer. Amen. Here's a note that I want to give you. We have Jesus on the inside of us, Christians. 
we don't think that way like we should. We keep thinking God's holding our hands and somewhere around us, but he is. But he's also living big inside of you. You say amen. Okay. We have to put our mind on what the word says in order for us to see what it says so our faith can work us to that place. So we have Jesus on the inside of us. Why? To give us wisdom, prudence, common sense, good judgment. How many know we need some good judgment to know what's right from wrong? And good dose of what we call common sense to give us balance and discretion and a wise discernment to be able to choose to say no and say yes to the things that we should or shouldn't. Say amen. God wants us that wise. My goodness. If you, if you had children, I have three lovely children. One, one we lost when he was in child in the womb. But I have two wonderful children, and they were taught at an early age the difference between right and wrong. They knew about God. Gee, my daughter and my son, hi, my daughter and my son, both were filled with the Holy Ghost when they were five, spoke in tongues. Amen. But they came forward to get filled with the Holy Ghost, and the ushers started making, no, 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 sit down. I said, leave them alone. They want to come up and get filled. God knows how to pull you. If you're really listening to God, he's going to pull you to him. You are being called home. Remember the scripture says in Hebrews that we're on a race set before us. The race is to go back home. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our home is laid up way beyond the blue. The angels beckon me through heaven's open door. And I don't feel at home in this world anymore. You see, there's a, a tugging. The older you get, you know, and the more you walk with Jesus, a tugging to go home. Why? Because you were meant to be with God. Every human being was. And that's why you have an up on them. They're a lost. You look them in the eye and says, you know, I got things to share with you that are so good. Don't, don't take it as religion, but they're so good. I want to share with you that you can get your hands on and live and enjoy. Would you like that? Oh, you, my, you're just talking religion, you see. We have to live the light. We have to live the witness. But we do it in love. We do it with joy. Why? Because uh, this world is not our home. We're going to cover these four things if you're ready. Number one, the hidden man of the heart. What is it? The hidden man of the heart. Two, trusting God in us. Folks, people don't know how to trust the God in you. If God is in you, why do you think he's putting you through the crud? He's not. Why do you think he's helping you to get in the flood? He's not. Why is he going to put you through the tribulation? Boo-boo. He's not. Because he's in here. Does you think he wants to go through hell again? How about experiencing the world again? No, his job is to get us out of here. And the sheep will hear his voice and he will lead them out. Woo-hoo! Can you feel the chills of God? Amen. Thirdly, Christians' common sense. We're going to talk about some do's and don'ts. And then fourthly, look forward to getting pruned. Again, the hidden man of the heart will discuss it, trusting in God in us, applying his wisdom. Three, Christian common sense. And fourthly, look forward to getting pruned. All right. Number one, so the hidden man of the heart. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians. And if, if you can't get there quick enough, go to index. And if you can't get there quick enough, just I'll read it to you. It's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23 and 24. You should be up there. Is it up there? I don't want to turn around because I want them to see that there's something there. No, I'm just kidding. All right, I probably should leave that alone. All right, verse 25. Oh, excuse me, 23. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Listen to what it says. Paul is speaking. Now may the God of peace himself, 
Sanctify, that word means it sets you apart completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Did you notice? Spirit, soul, and body. I want you to just see that. We're not going to stay there very long. But we need to know what the hidden man of the heart is. Now go with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 4. Here Peter's encouraging people. You don't have to decorate yourself outwardly. Yeah, I look pretty. I drive a painted car and I, my wife wears makeup. But it says you don't have to, you know, fake it and make yourself, you know. He says it's really your relationship with God on the inside of your heart. So here's what it says. Let it be rather, instead of all the jewelry and everything, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with an incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet, quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. Now, a quiet spirit means you're quiet. You're not agitated before God. I mean, you could be loud at times. That's okay. <laughs> Shout to the Lord, you know. But what this is talking about is that you've come to a place in your walk where you've come to contentment. Paul said something like this. You can look it up later. He says, whatever state that I am or condition that I am, I have learned to be content in God. There's another scripture in Timothy. It says, godliness with contentment is great gain. These are not my scriptures, so I can't just pop them off at you. Because we brought nothing into the world, and we're not going to carry anything out. You are going to carry something, though. What are we going to carry? The life and the newness of life that God has given us, we're going to carry that back as he switches us up. Why? Because we're going to be rewarded so there's an account going on. There's a debit credit sheet going on in your life right now. Every word that we say, this is just sobering, every is being written down. Every word. Thank God the thoughts aren't, but you know. And it says, and, and, and if you think, boy, your life's been just, got a whole bunch of stuff you shouldn't have been saying and everything. What do you do, Pastor Kerry? You simply say, Jesus Right now, nullify every word that I spoke in my life that isn't your will for my life and cause it to be not anymore accountable to it. And a big old race hand of blood will come right over that. And then from this day forward, try to watch what you say. Say amen. All right. It's a discipline. Because there's really, you got two fountains. We learned that last week. You got an old man fountain that doubts things. I call it spiritual Tourette's. And you got the new man fountain that speaks Jesus. We want to shut the old man off and open up the new man. Say amen. So let it be the hidden person of the heart. Now, in the Bible, say in the Bible. Did you notice my pants are real long? I'm sorry about that. If I step on and fall on my head, just smile. You know, I'm just, it's okay. I know it's augmented. Amen. So what you got to realize is there's some things that we need to concentrate as a, as a, as a Christian. I stepped on my pants and almost did toss. All right, so listen. You need to catch this, okay? The heart, the word heart in the Bible has two meanings, okay? It means your very core of your person, okay? It's not referring to your chest heart. Okay, and you'll read through the Old and New Testament. I'll put a new heart in you. Okay, the hidden man of the heart. Let it be a soft and quiet part of your heart. We follow God with our heart. Now, in the Old Testament, it says the heart's deceitful. Okay, so let me tell you. Your heart is your spirit and your soul. Everyone say spirit and soul. Let me explain. Your spirit man is the real you. It looks through the mess out into the world. Hello. And then when we get born again, Jesus comes and he mixes with your spirit, takes out the old poison, and you become one with God. This is why it's so hard for you to lose your salvation. Okay? Because you and God have been knitted together now in your spirit. The Bible calls us a new creation such as never existed before. 
we're indwelt by God. So that means we need to let him take over because he's wiser, he's smarter, he's everything. But only a prideful person will never surrender totally to God. But a very humble person, a very honest and open person surrenders daily with God and grows exponentially. And that's what we want for you to grow a lot, to mature quickly. We haven't got a lot of time. But so I have to present you, pastors are, are responsible for these three things about his congregation. Number one, to pray for you. Number two, to present you before God and to give you God's purest word that he knows to give you. Remember, not everybody knows everything. So a pastor can only operate in what areas that he knows and he's graced with. So don't pick on any of God's children. Say anathema, anathema. You know what I mean? It's curse it when you do. So if you don't like you know, Pastor Joel, don't say anything about him. Smile. Bless God's children whether you like them or not. Because don't be stupid enough to know that's how the devil makes the church powerless. To get us to talk things against another part of the body of Christ. That's not be dummies. We're not dummies. Don't let the devil play people like that. You have somebody start to do that with you. Say, oh, hold it right there. Let me tell you about anathema. Amen. That yawn was for Jesus. Amen. So, a hidden man of the heart. So, let's find, let it be the hidden man of the heart. So, let's talk about church. Most Christians don't even know they are a three-part being. We just already covered that. Spirit, soul, and body. Not knowing this literally confuses their walk. Because if you think your body is who you really are, then you're going to want to pamper it, and then it will just take you on a journey. Mm -mm -mm. You need to know the real you is behind all this in your spirit man with God in it now. You need to feed your spirit, starve your flesh, and educate your mind with the word of God. Educate your mind. And folks, not the Old Testament where the devil will take you. It's not wrong to study the Old Testament. But it is a waste of time if you don't know where to look. Hello? Ask somebody who's looking for gold in the wrong places. You'll find the gold in the New Testament in the name of Jesus. Now, I'm not putting any other testament down. But I have known somebody who wonderful teachers have gone off sideways and missed everything that Apostle Paul wrote. He says, don't be Judaized. Pull back into the Old Testament and the Old Testament practices because you'll fall from grace and you'll insult the name of Christ. Now, guess what's going on out there? All kinds of deceptions everywhere, all the time. You have to stay so focused on God in this day and age, so centered. And the way I can help you to do that who do you meet with first? When? Why? Because it starts your day right. It gets you all tuned up. Oh, I don't, you hear that? Well, listen, you're going to go through the same habits and patterns over. Aren't you tired of yourself? Come on, smile up at me. I get tired of myself. I get up in the morning, who do I look in the mirror? Who do I see? Hopefully, Jesus. All right, let's go on. So, another thing, church, again, we're three-part being two. Mankind was changed, and we were designed in these three parts. We were segmented. So, when Adam and Eve ate of the tree, sinned, their soul went one place, their body went another place, their spirit shut off. And now, through Jesus Christ, God wants to set us and retune us. Hello? We're out of phase. Now he's getting us in phase. Hello? And in order to do that, we have to help you get a healthy exposure to God every day. You just can't do it without anything. You don't have any gas in your tank? You're going to be gasless in Puyallup. <laughs> All right. Folks, listen to this. Mankind was designed in three parts, just as our God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. 
So we're spirit, soul, and body. Each of us has a function. The soul has its function. The body has its function. Our spirit man has its function. Do you know them? And finally, fourthly, we are God's property and we are God indwelt. Say, I'm God indwelt. Do you know how the people in the Old Testament longed to be able to have God dwelling amongst them? Constantly. Remember, God would come and go. God would come and go. God would look at them and they're sinning and he'd have to turn his back. I mean, they was coming and going. They never knew the Father God. They knew God. And only the special ones that got close enough to God to follow him, Abraham called the friend of God, David a man after God's own heart, is because they kept with it. They kept after God to get through all the static and let get into the core of what God wanted to do in their life. Hello? How many has ever had a project you want to get done, but something seemed to rise up on the way to getting it done? Amen. That's why we need the wisdom of God to meet with God so he can move all that out of the way and make the path clear. He clears the path. We don't clear the path. We clear our heads moving right along. All right, second point. Trusting God in us. Applying the wisdom he's given us. How many know God in us is wisdom? And why does James talk about let wisdom have her perfect work? Because he's talking, now listen carefully. He's talking to Jewish people, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, greeting. Jewish people are very, very, now please don't, I'm not mad. They're stubborn. They got stubborn because of a religious spirit. So he has to talk to them almost in code. Instead of saying, oh, these are born again Jews and not born again Jews, but they're all interested in following God. So he says, let patience have her perfect work. Well, how many know that patience is Jesus? How many know you don't have enough patience? Come on, smile at somebody. Say, I don't have enough patience. You don't. Don't pray for patience. Pray for God to take over in that area where you feel impatient. He's in there. He's the patience. Or maybe you're the patient. <laughs> Come on, laugh with me. And so knowing that, knowing that's so powerful, but you've got to reflect on it. God told Joshua, look, Moses is dead. You've got to reflect on all the things I need for you to reflect on so that you'll be a mighty man. So do we. We need to be reflecting on what God has told us. Amen. Go with me to Ephesians 3. Look at this wonderful. Verses 20 and 21. Trusting God in us, applying his wisdom. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Who's that? God, where does he live? In your heart too. Boy, you guys, sounds sheepy. Sounds like the devil's convinced to something else. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works where? You see, God's at work in you. Every day when you present yourself, God's working on your behalf. He's working for your good. He's moving and he's grooving. But you got to listen to him. He wants to order our steps. He wants to take over so he can shield you. So you don't get darts in your back and in your face. And when men and people of, of God or people of the world insult you, you don't take it seriously. You realize they're lost. I don't know about you. When I go to the doctor, I have a real problem. I want to make sure I pray first. Hello. Yeah. And look at verse 21. To him be glory in the church. That's us, everyone. Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, go with me to Philippians chapter 2. Look at this one. This is God in you. Verse 12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you always obeyed, not only in my presence only, this is Paul the Apostle talking, 
but now in much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are we to work out our salvation? Well, there's the key miss, and we'll get it in the next verse. Folks, you don't work for your salvation. Because you're saved, you love to work. Period. You do things for God because you love God. That's period. You're not, you're not working to get favor from God. You're not doing things to get. Amen. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But who do we work our salvation out with? Yeah, with Jesus in our heart. Can you say amen? Look at the next scripture. This is beautiful. Catch this. For it is God who works in us. So we're working together as a partnership. Now, there's only one thing that will cut that off. It is our selfish decision to do something without asking God. What do you mean, Pastor? I'm talking about the bigger things. For example, if you came into my house and you were there, but you saw the garbage just needed to be dumped and you, you saw there was a few things that needed to be picked up. If you took it upon yourself and you did those things, you would think you were doing wonderful, but God would think you were trespassing because you're doing things without permission, even though you're intending to do them good. So what we need to do is learn how that works. Never step in front of God if you can help it. Let God help step you through. So we are in God's house. This is just a building. But the Bible calls it God's house. The church building down the street that loves Jesus, that's God's house too. But you are his church. See, the people are the church. The building is housing the church or God's house. Therefore, when we're in God's house, it's the same logic. Hello. It's the same logic. We want to treat our gathering together as precious and holy. How you treat me, I, how I treat you, is how we're supposed to be treating Jesus. If you've done it unto the least of my little ones, you've done it unto me. I mean, Jesus goes as far as to say, if you have not done it to anybody, you have not done it unto me. Wow, that's some heavy stuff to meditate. He really means that. He says, I've given you the power under me to sow and reap, to give, to help. I've given you the power to choose life and death. Therefore, let me suggest to you, I'm paraphrasing, choose life. <laughs> God's saying, choose life. And you and your offspring will live. Don't be like so many other people that James, again, says, a double-minded man is what? Ooh, what else does it say? Let that, that man or woman think they will receive anything from the Lord. Now, do you think the devil knows that? So what does he do with a, with a believer? He gets us. Now, listen careful. I'm going to show you the simplicity of double-mindedness. All of us have it. We have to work on it. Okay? We have a fleshly part, and we have a spiritual part. And it, during the day, as we learn to walk with Jesus, we're vacillating between the two. Everything's going good. Until somebody insults you. And then all of a sudden you go negative. You see what I'm saying? We're vacillating. This is double-mindedness. How many know that if you presented yourself to God, you turned over your day, how you going to, you're going to walk with him. No matter what comes your way, you're still in tune with God. Because that's what you're doing. You're focusing on God, not what's said or not said, what's done or not done. You know, people fall into this trap. God... You want me to say that? Okay, I will. He says, a lot of people really love people and care about people. But a lot of times they're doing it because they want to be loved and cared for. And that's good. But we can't love, expect people to love the way you love them, to love you back that way. Right. And if you do, you're going to be trapped because yeah. we're going to let you down. So if you're one of those personalities that need the attention, oh, me, me, and about that, be careful of that. It's the enemy doing that. Right. Why? Because when you don't get it, your life falls apart. Yep. Alone. We don't want that to happen. 
Your friend first is Jesus. Now listen, if it helps you, look up at me. I'll be your friend forever. I won't get mad at you. I might, you might frustrate me, but I'll never dump you as a friend. Have you ever had, don't raise your hand. People, oh, I love you, I love you. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you do something wrong, you don't see them again, they write you off. That is not Christianity. That's, hypocr that's the hypocrite, Hippocratic action. Anyway, it's not right. We'll just say it that way. Be careful. You cannot love people with your love. I'm a very loving man. I can't love you, all of you, with, with my love. It'll fall short. I love you with God's love. Another thing, don't set your eyes on people. We're to know no man after the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13 through 17. No, no man. Don't look at the flesh. That's not really them. That's them thinking who they are and trying to be something. And you know what? That's like you're just a little boo boo ba boo puppet. We just bobbled around and do all that. Oh, speak for yourself, Pastor Kerry. I am speaking to myself. Without me being in the hands of God, I'm a mess. Eyes up on me. You are too. That's why I love you beyond your physical appearance. I love the God factor in your heart. Your love for him. Your beauty. You're beautiful in your spirit person. This is just an old cracked shell. Let it crack off and the new life come up. Remember, I don't know, but I planted a lot of seed when I was younger. And the seed has to break away and the new life has to bring out. Your old life has to break away. That's called your flesh. What you want to do, the way you want to do it. Your stubbornness, your argumentative with your wife, with your husband. That has to crack away. And it's not going to crack away if you keep doing it. You've got to bring it to God and let him crack it off you. Everyone say, I love to be pruned. Believe it or not. The more like Jesus you become, the more pruned you are. And it's great because the pruning is beautiful. We always relate the, puni the pru pruning to the physical pr pruning. Jesus is saying, no, when I prune you, I do it from the inside out. We'll get to that later. Are you with me? So how many got the idea that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world? So church, many of us have been trained to know the Jesus in us. I was raised in schooling that taught us the word of faith, how to walk in Christ, be led by the Spirit, all these things, wonderful things. But the churches today are not being taught that, and I'll tell you why. Not because they're so bad, no. It's because a lot of the pastors don't, aren't trained in that either. They, remember, and not faulting anyone, we can only give out what we know. I'm not going to tell you about a car if I don't know anything about it. If I do, the Bible calls me in Proverbs a fool. To say you know something and know it not. Moving right along. Are you with me? Philippians chapter 2, look at this. Okay. All right. Trusting in God in us, applying his wisdom. Philippians 2, look at verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, say, that's me, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence, but also in my absence, work out your own salvation. Now, you and God work together. Let's see how you can grow in the next month. Now, here's the funny thing for pastors. We're seeing a falling away. Churches are not being attended like they should be. And if it isn't something new and, and more circus-like, they won't bother We've been lulled and tricked. When a true revival breaks loose, first starts in our heart. Makes us want to be with God, want to go to church no matter what. Just causes us to want to be with God. That's revival. Now, if you get others to follow you along, not to follow you, but all join in with that, then it's catching. The fire is catching. Now, it's happening all over the land in the other areas of the world. But we don't hear about it because we have a d disdain, freckless news media. They don't report good news. They tell everybody the gossips. 
So turn them out. Get into God because many, many wonderful things are happening all over. Ask God to guide you and you're looking through your, your media and everything where these places are and pray for them and go after them and ask God to stir you up and get you to start leading others like you're supposed to. Stop following others. Well, everybody's going to the Saturday church. Well, that's fine, but did God tell you to go there? Oh, no. well, no, it's not going to be that. Too. But if somebody told you to do that, do it. I mean, but just obey what God told you to do. Stop comparing. And, 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 and. Your eyes are everywhere where they're not supposed to be. Put them on Jesus. Jesus is unifying, gathering. He's not separating and dividing. Hello? So, many of us have to be trained to trust God's indwelling in us. Just ask him to help teach you. We have to talk the same talk, walk the same way, in order to not come against the way the system of God is set up. The kingdom of God has a system in it. You can't break every rule and expect God to bless you. I mean, I can't get up on the top of the building and jump off and expect to wiggle myself and fly. You got to know what works, what's principles, the good, the perfect and acceptable will of God. In order to do that, you have to be with God. You have to walk with God. You have to skip out on all the religious junk out there. You are not a religious person. You have a relationship. Build on that. Not Pastor Kerry and his charms, okay? All right. Amen. Thank you, sister. We talk about how God has deposited all things that pertain to life and godliness in us, right? Find out what they are. Get your hands on them. This is also, we are to learn to consult his word. Folks, people are getting away from the word of God. They're assuming the word says something. You better go in there and find out. For example, let me give you one. The Bible says, thank God for all things. Does it say that? See, you can't even answer. No. All things aren't from God. The things up from God are from God. The things that are not from God are God. Jesus said, what belongs to Caesar is Caesar. What belongs to God is God's. There's a division line. Can you say amen? A lot of Christians don't know. So they got this jumbled up interpretation of God because they're not consulting the word. And the word says every good, every perfect gift comes from who? God. So if it's not good, if it's not perfect, it comes from either two other sources, you, humanity, or the devil. So you have a right as a believer to discern your thoughts your intents, you have to discern what others are saying to your life. Be responsible enough. You have to give an answer for your own personal walk, not the walk of others. So you want to make sure that you are really good and serious with God, but enjoy him. My goodness, delight yourself in the father of your creation. Well, I don't understand. That's because you got to get closer to him. I've been walking with God pretty close. All that I've been through. Did you ever go through hard times, Carrie? Well, kind of. Have you ever made big mistakes? Big, big mistakes. But I made them. And I made them by not listening to God. You will make them too. Maybe not mine. So stop picking on everybody's mistakes. You all make them. You without sin cast the first stone. Let's get beyond the childhood Christians. And let's get the act to follow after our father and become miracle workers. Amen. You should lay hands on the sick and they should get up. That would impress your children, wouldn't it? But you're not laying hands on anybody because you're scared they might not get up. Where are you at? Doubt and unbelief. Don't do that. Believe in the God who dwells in you. All right, let's move on to the next one. Say amen. All right, let me read James chapter 3 while you go to the next one. 
okay, which is Christian common sense. James chapter 3, look at 17 and 18. Just listen to this. But the wisdom that is from above, who's that? God. Where does he live now? He's not only there and we're with him there, but he's with us here. So you have all the wisdom you'll ever need inside your spirit, man. Now the key is, if you're humble, you can dip into that wisdom and God will be able to teach you by the Holy Spirit. If you're prideful, he will resist it because you think you know how to do it. Have you ever said to your kid, I need you to do this? And they go, I know, I know, I know. I'm talking about 60% of the body of Christ will look at you and they won't receive any teaching at all. And you can tell that their life is, and they'll say, I know, I know, I know. No, you don't know. Your life shows that you don't know. So please be quiet and know that he's God. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you this one thing again. You see, how many of you know that in the Bible there's a group called the Samaritans? They were from Sumer. And Sumer is the place. I'm going to take you on a journey for a minute because you guys ought to study your Bible and stop being religious. Sumer is the place where Satan's group fell from heaven. And they started a civilization, turned into Egypt and all that. We see that with something there was woo. But they retaught the humanity all the wrong things. They taught us how to war, how to trade, how to rip each other off, how to do, play makeup, cast spells. And they taught all of that. And they have their own gospel of creation, which is a complete reverse and lie. And, and one of the things, this is going to be an insult to you. They say that man can't shut up. They talk too much. They're over-opinionated. And frankly, we just need to get rid of them. That's how the devil looks at you. I'm just telling you, I study a lot. I mean, I'm not a, you know, a PhD yet. I'll get close. But I study a lot for, our, for the congregation and for the body of Christ. That's what I'm supposed to do. And I want to put, put together all these pieces that everybody just kind of pushes aside because they don't know how to explain them. No, you need to know and have the answers. So there's a whole system of lies operating and a whole kingdom of truth. We have to choose on a daily basis which one we're going to pay attention to. It's a daily choice. Say, I got it. So the wisdom from above is first peaceable. Peaceable, gentle, willing to be taught, yield. Folks, you don't have to have your say. I, I'm amazed. I, I tell somebody I need you to do that and to come back with an excuse. That's wrong. Don't come back. Don't talk back to people. Especially if it's across the room. Someone say, oh yeah. Willing to yield. Full of mercy and good fruits. Without being partial. Without partiality. That means I'm not going to treat you one way because you have a million bucks. And the one that come in and begs food all the time, any differently. Hello? Now, you might see me as a pastor, Pastor Linda, my wife. We'll come to the people that visit, and we'll visit with them a little bit more. That's our job. But when they're here. I mean, it's not my job to chase people around the countryside and try to talk them into coming to church. If they're that stupid to stay away from church, I don't know if I could talk them into it. It's not my job to talk people into things. It's my job to present a good gospel, a good truth, amen, something that's clean, a place where you can go to receive. That's all I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not here to impress. I had my impression. been all over the world. Gosh, if I drop names, I'd bore you. Rick Renner is a personal friend of mine. We spent hours in a hot tub talking and sharing. I'm the one to ask him to please start your Greek school. He'll tell you. Every time I, I see him at a meeting, and if I'm in that meeting, he'll go out of his way and come and hug Linda and I. So there, there's lots of friends we know, but to me, you're more important than they. I'm not here to impress you, but I'm here to teach you. I mean, I'm almost 46 year old in the Lord. I mean, that's a baby. But I do have and have experience enough to want to give you things so don't, you don't fall off the same bridge I did. Hello? 
If you're walking that trail, avoid that bridge. All right. Christian common sense. Everyone said common sense. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Now, we're going to read this out of the message. This is the message Bible. I love what it said. This is Proverbs chapter 1, 3 and 4. This is a manual for living. It says, a manual for living, for learning what's right and just and fair. To teach the unexperienced the ropes. To give our young people a grasp on reality. Doesn't that sound good? Amen. That's why the word is given to us. To get us past the junk that we're hearing every day. Tune out to the world. Tune in, tune up with God. Second Corinthians, here's another one. Second Corinthians is kind of like an example for us. In chapter 6, what should we do as Christians? How should we grow? What's the difference? Well, today you see a lot of Christians are compromised. Satan is sought to it, to compromise them. So he always has a guilt trip to lay on them whenever they try to get really on fire for God. Don't play with the enemy. You can play with the serpent, he'll bite you. I know, I got bit several times. What'd you do, Pastor Kerry? It's none of your business. Believe me, God will talk to me about it, and he has. But I, I'm not, I don't live an open, simple life. I don't have any secret sins. What I have is open. I found out this. Check this. Write this down. Everything that we hide, God will expose. Everything we expose to God, God will hide. He covers a multitude of. You see, so when you go to God, when you talk with God, when you're with God, be open, honest, forthright. He understands what you're going through. You have a, a body of sin. He, if you're a woman, he understands your pains and your aches, your emotions. If you're a man, your drives, the different things. So stop thinking God's so stupid, don't understand you. And also that you're not, and, oh, I'm a, I feel so alone. Well, where are those feelings coming from? Satan, and you've been rejected here recently, so you feel all alone. Feelings, nothing more than feelings. That's the serpent's trick to make you sick. To occupy your time so you don't experience the divine. We were meant to be with God. Every day God is surrounding you. We woke up in God even though you acknowledge him or not. But the acknowledging of God makes you interface with him. Father, I acknowledge you and I acknowledge your son. Interface right there. You know what? That interface cuts the devil out of everything. Trouble is, we don't stay interfaced. We go, all right, I'll get back with you later. So listen to this. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You got to work with them, but you don't hang around the bar with them, okay? And the reason being, oh gosh, I, I realize I did. Nothing good comes out of darkness. And the friendships you have, are they alcohol friends or... Come on, let's just think about that silliness. It's silliness. Do not be unequally yoked together. I thought that has to do when you get married. It has to do with everything. Read Psalms 1. And it says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Communion means connection. And what accord or agreement, excuse me, I get the hiccups, as Christ with Beal. <coughs> In the Old Testament, you'll read a lot of these words called Beal or Baal. How many remember reading it? They worship Baal. That's just another name in their language for the devil, the serpent. Baal means serpent. Huh? Serpent. Think about it. Oh, yeah, he has lots of faces, but it means serpent. So 
Let's put serpent in there. Wouldn't that be something? Okay. And it says, what agreement has Christ with the serpent? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God? That's your body. That's your body with idols. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. Yay. And I will walk among them. Yay. Everywhere you go, you're in God. God's ahead of you. God's behind you. You're full of God. Well, what's the problem? We're more conscious and aware of what we're doing and not what God and our awareness of God is doing. Whatever we lend ourselves and our consciousness is what we become aware of. If you don't know that there is a snake over there in the bushes, I'm talking about a real snake, but you hear it rattle, then you're aware, you see. God wants us to be aware where the enemy is, be more aware and hear God's voice, more in tune with what God has because we have a job to do. That is to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, preach the kingdom of power. The church has lost a lot of power. We need to get that power back and continue to preach the, the gospel, the word of power. Can you say amen? And it goes on. And he says, I love this part. Now, this is a sobering. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell with them. I will walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Verse 17. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. Now, folks, I have to explain. Something that is unclean, you'll know immediately. It could be different things for different folks, but it all does not glorify God. For example, I had a guy tell me, I don't go to the beach anymore because there's too many pretty women. and I happen to lust after them. I looked at him and I said, no, this is the truth. I'm looking at a man of God who's teaching others. I looked at him, I said, you're not lusting. You're looking at what God created. They're beautiful. But you're not to want something else you can't have. That's covetousness. So what you got to do is you've got to grow spiritually so that you become blind to the effects of the world. Now, I've been on the mission field. Folks, people in the mission field don't wear any clothes at all. And you're supposed to act like nothing there. Now, that's mission work. Different. I'm not proud of that. You're talking to a mom and dad adults, and they're totally mature. They have children. Totally naked as a jaybird giving you food. What are you going to say? I'm sorry, I got to go. <laughs> no. Come on now. Come on now. So in other words, we're not looking at the... We, you've got to get your eyes off that physical realm so much. Matthew 7 tells us, hey, don't look at the specks in everybody else's eyes. They got plenty. Check your own self with God. Make sure you're doing all right. You do that first thing every morning meeting with him. All right, a couple of points before we go on. Again, 70, come out from among and be a separate and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. There's something about you trying to live two lives. You cannot be on the fence trying to hang out with the world and hang out with God. What will happen is it will cross over and leak in, and it will neutralize your ability to relate to God, and Satan will sell you on a good of condemnation. Now, I am not saying you can't have a beer once in a while. I don't condone it. I don't do it myself. Or a glass of wine if you think you need it. But you'll outgrow that too. That won't be important to you anymore. It used to be important. I was an entertainer, so I had to have drinks. Or at least fake it. Can you ever seen a drunk drummer? Let's not go there. Come on, I'm, I'm human. Remember, I started off as a sinner. I'm trying to tell you, there's some things you can wonderfully avoid if you will just listen to the wisdom God has for us. And he lives in your heart. He lives in your heart. Church, we are a new creation in Christ with kingdom gifts, kingdom abilities. We shouldn't be messing with the fire of the world. We shouldn't be paying attention to what's going on in the world all that much either. Because it can affect our moods. Two, we enter our day with meeting with God. Why? So he can tune us up, tune us in, take out. So you have, all of us have things wrong with our soul. 
little itches and gitches and wax and woos. And we have to expose our soul to the one who sips it all out and, and heals it. You've got grooves in your soul. Everyone say, I'm a groovy soul person. These are little habits through your life that you keep falling into, slipping into. These are little grooves that the enemy and through circumstances of life we place there. We bring ourselves before God and he washes those grooves out and then puts his life playing in your mind. You wake up in the morning with a song on your heart. He did it. He did it for me. He did it. He hadn't done anything yet, the devil will cry. He says, yes, he did. He died for me 2,000 years ago. See, where we focus, where we focus allows us either to see the light or continue to be hidden from it. Thirdly, we appear clean and filled, full of light. We're charged up, say amen. But throughout the day, you get challenges, so the light dims. Remember, the armor of God has never been taken off you. Now, I know it says put on the armor of God, but you do that when you get saved. You say, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive my sin. God clothes you with Christ. He puts his armor on you. Now, here's what happens. When you get with God, you stay with God, you get on fire with God, the light of God charges up your armor, and the armor stays bright, clean, and pure. Satan cannot look past the armor. But what happens to many Christians, because we're religious rather than disciplined, we won't meet with God, and so what will happen is we'll appear. We'll get up in the morning, say, God, give me my cares and everything. Lord, I hope you're with me during the day, and then you go right out, and the devil's just watching you. Oh, look, what can we do for Carrie? Oh, yeah, Sister Bertha over here, she's hating everybody. Have her pull out in front of Carrie and have her smack him. Ain't going to happen, boss. Why isn't it going to happen? Because Carrie's a man of prayer. And he's prayed and given his whole day to, we can't get to him. Well, how about getting a hold of one of his relatives? You know, so he lets them in the house and maybe they can come in and pick and bring something in, maybe a piggyback boogaloo. Uh, we can't get to him. He's prayed for all the relatives. You see, God wants us wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. He wants us to listen to our master because the Holy Spirit will resist the proud and give grace to the humble. So we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. We humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And what does he do? He shall lift us up. You go down, he lifts you up. You go up, and he puts you down. Because he won't have pride parading around as a child of God, telling everybody what they know all the time. It's very displeasing to God. Say, oh, meet someone. And we should meet with God at bedtime at night, too. Why? I always call it, we meet with God. That's the door. We open our door with God. And at night, we need to dump the bag. Folks, all day long, you're collecting thoughts and people's words, responsibilities at work. You're collecting all that, and it's going all into your soul like a bag. And it's, whoosh, 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 and it's blowing up. So you get it, and you come, and you're tired. You eat dinner. You're just wore out. And you're really sleepy. Be smart enough to say, Father, all the cares, all the junk I received during the day, I just bind it up. And I dump the bag. Just say, Father, in Jesus' name, I give you all this. And you just imagine you just throw the bag into the trash. And Lord, now seal the door so I rest pure and deep. And rejuvenate me when I wake up in the morning. You should have a prayer that way at night if you don't start. Because that will close everything off at night. And that you'll gain the, a greater gain in the morning. Hello. Refresh you in the morning. Remember, we have not because, we have not because, and, so, and sometimes it's because we don't know how to ask. And it's all right, that's where I come in. And others like, are like us, sharing and helping each other to grow. Hello. Next point. Looking forward to getting pruned. Now, folks, God is always kind and merciful. 
Let me tell you this. God never uses circumstances to teach you. I know that you've probably been told that God, if you're not going to listen, circumstances are going to scream in your face. But I want to tell you, the reason why we go bad through a lot of bad circumstances, I didn't say all, but a lot about is because of wrong choices, wrong meditations of our heart. And we make, make those choices are influenced wrongly. For example, picking people you're mad at you and they're not actually mad at you. It happens. Hello. Now, put yourself, put yourself in, in the military. Your, your uh, crew chief just got through screaming at you because you're an idiot. I mean, he's just screaming at you. Are you going to get mad at him and have a little pout? No, but the church does. Thank God pastors don't scream at their, you know, and stuff like that. But there are things that are really tough for us to let go of. My job is to dig it out of you. And so from time to time, and, and this is a good thing, I'm going to sit down with you and let's go over your performance before God. Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean I'm your judge or anything. But if something's out of line and everybody said something to you, maybe the, if I said something, it might help. The idea is never make somebody feel bad or attacked, but always help somebody up. Hello, I say, help somebody up. Folks, when we help people up on their way to God, if they happen to come down, you'll be there to help them up again. If you go up with God and you happen to fall down, those you helped up will be there to help you up. As we sow, so shall be rude to someone, you're going to get rudeness back. Can you say thank I, I'm amazed at how many people can't say thank you. Look you in the eyes and say, thank you. That's really nice. I know quite a few of you do. But other people who have always lived off of somebody else's cups, they have a hard time saying thankful because everything's handed to them. Now, don't be like that. Always say thankful. Now, do we thank God for everything? No. We thank God in everything. And that's what it says. He says, you might be in a bad situation right now. Start thanking God. Not for the situation. Thank your way out. Thank your way out of the situation. Paul and Silas, Acts 16. Both got thrown into stocks, into the part of the jail where the urine and everything runs down over the prisoners below. Their faces are the stocks. And I can hear Silas saying to Paul, this is another fine mess you got me into. Come on. No. Paul looks at Silas, and Silas says to Paul, says, God will get us out of this one. And they started praying and singing hymns. They started rejoicing. And if you read the account, God was so pleased with it, he sent an earthquake, let them loose, opened up all the prison doors. Now for a Roman jailer, that means death. If your prisoners get out, you're dying. Dummy, you died, you let them out. And so the jailer runs in, he says, oh my gosh, and he gets ready to kill himself all on his sword. And Paul says, no. Now, remember, it's pitch black. Nobody knows anything but the Holy Spirit. Paul can sense what's going to go on. He says, do yourself no harm. Get us cleaned up. We're going to your house and we're going to get your family saved. This is your God who lives in you. We need to trust in that. He's not changed. We have. We've been distracted away for a while. Oh, speak for yourself, Pastor Kerry. Oh, come on. We all lured away sometimes. Looking forward to getting pruned. John 15, and we're done. I am the vine, Jesus said, and my father is the owner of the whole world, the vine dresser. Every branch in me, that's you, that does not, excuse me, every branch in me, notice the term in me. I want to stop right there. Every little word like that is important. Notice where they are. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. 
every branch that bears fruit, he what? Prunes. Now, what's he saying? Does he throw people away? No. If we don't have the juice of God running in our spirit, man, then we've already broken off of the vine. Folks, if I have a tree and a branch broke off the tree, is that a tree branch? Yeah, did that branch come from the tree? But it's no longer alive. So to take it away here in the Greek means the life has left it. The life has left the branch. Now here's another mystery. When you were born in the earth first time, you were alive to God. Your spirit person was alive. Your body was torted or whatever. <laughs> but our spirit and soul came from God. We were alive. And it's not till we get to the age, you guys need to memorize this, to where we started sassing mom and dad and choosing to do right and wrong, and our spirit literally shut off and separated from God. That's why we need to be relit. It's called being born again. God needs to relight what he's originally put in you that Satan has snuffed out through your flesh. Now, if Satan can snuff out the love, life of God in a child, it be behoove us no longer to be a child as adults and to let that light snuff out again. So the only way I, as a pastor, can help you is to encourage you, if I don't have to drop kick you Jesus, to meet with God first thing every morning. Half of your problems will go away. They'll start dying away. Because you'll have God's wisdom operating, and you'll be in tune. And you won't be guessing about your walk. Many Christians today are guessing what, about their walk. What should I do? What should I do? And Satan says, keep it up. I love that kind of thing. You're double-minded. Remember, Satan plays every human as a fool. Doesn't matter if you're saved or not. Hang up on him. And keep the line dead. The voice of a stranger we will not follow. So it says, I am the true vine, my father's the branch. Every branch in me that bears fruit, he takes away doesn't bear fruit. Every branch in me that he bears much fruit, he prunes that it be, may bear, boy, my mouth, I got to get my mouth, that it may bear more fruit. God's into making you better. Hello? You are already, he says to his disciples, clean because of the word that I keep speaking to you. Folks, you're clean today because of the word I'm speaking out after you. Why? Because the word is God and the God is his. And when you speak the word, the word has a cleansing godly effect and cleanses our, our soul and gives us hope. You are already clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except if it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless... You abide in me. Take note. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can't do anything. So let's like sober up. You can't even breathe without him. Be thankful. All right. If anyone does not abide in me, listen, listen. This is why a lot of Christians are having problems. They're not staying with Christ. They're not befriending God. Okay? He is cast out as a branch and withered. Why? Because our substance is God. And if we keep away from the substance and our nurture, we're going to shrivel up. Take a look around you. How many shrivel Christians have you seen lately? Come on, chuckle with me. Their life's been trashed. There's no reason. Come here. Let me sit down with you for a week and just teach you one-on-one -on -one for a while on what you really need to know and practice rather than all this wonderful mystic stuff. What do you mean mystic? Uh, for example, Judaism. God doesn't want you a Jew. You're already a Jew having Jesus. So the mysticism is, is something new, something fresh, but is it something that brings you closer to Christ? That's the thing. 
If it doesn't, then it's just fun. It's going to bingo. That's fun. There's nothing wrong. It's nothing spiritual going to bingo. Nothing really wrong with it. It's just fun. But don't make God just fun. Learn and grow. Help someone else up the ladder of life. Amen. And finishing. He says, I am the vine again. Verse 5. And you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Drop down to verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, say I, amen. Now notice there's no room for maybe. There's no maybe here. Christians, with God in you, when you let God take control, your life won't be a maybe. Your life will be secure day in and day out. Oh, you'll have challenges, but they will no longer control you. Well, what if so-and-so does something? Let him do something. Aren't you praying for them? So pray they don't. Do you know how much command and control we have in Christ? Just sitting down and praying? Do you realize the command and control we have in Christ? When I say, Father, in the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit whisks me up. I sit before the throne of Almighty God. And then I just begin to talk. Now, I don't tell God what I'm going through because he already knows. That's like boring God with yourself. I say, God, your word says I have children that are not saved. Go and save them. See, our job is to send God spiritually through the words of our mouth in prayer. Our job is not to swing at the enemy because we're so upset and rebuke and gossip and all that. That's Satan's game he's playing with you. I can move mountains sitting at my prayer with God. Why? Because God is God. I'm just little me. Little me with a covenant with a very, very unbeatable God. Now, the key is you got to get closer to your God. Because a lot of people can't operate that way because they're not sure. We're not quite sure. We're not quite sure. That will go away when you spend more time with him. All right. I know your heads are full. Your hearts are full. And it's about as all you can hear. But you're not going to get 20-minute sermons from me. I am sorry. I will not do that to you. I can. Oh, I can jump. I can even do a cartwheel. But that is not what you, you need. You don't need your pastor to entertain you, to be Mr. Hero Dynamic. You need me to teach you all the wisdom I have before I go on to be with my God. Amen. And the only reason Lynn and I have this place is for believers to come and learn. This isn't me trying to build a church. I own all of this outward, but I gave it to God. It's paid for and all. What I mean, we still make payments, but nobody owns that. I don't rent a school. I don't need some big building project where you guys are in debt and you have to keep giving me money. That's all stupid stuff. What is neat is we let God be God here. And listen, if you'll sit long enough under the word, he will restore you. Oh, yeah, you'll have some scars, but the pain of those scars will go. And he'll restore your love for people and your care for others. And he'll put in you the fruit of the Spirit. And you'll start bringing forth all that. And remember, when all that starts to happen, when you have a house that you didn't build yourself and you live in, when you eat from food that you didn't plant yourself, you go to the store and buy it. And when you drive a car that gets you around in split time, don't forget the Lord your God who brought you out of your sin and into this new kingdom. Don't forget to be thankful and appreciative and daily meet with your God. Remember, don't date Jesus. Lord, I'm in trouble. Here I am again. Marry Jesus. You're his bride. Oh, did you get anything out of that? <laughs> 